Hello, everybody. Welcome to Facebook Live. I'm Darlene Merkler with Inland Caregiver Resource Center. And I'm here on Facebook Live every Tuesday and Thursday with 15-minute uh, presentations to help family caregivers. And this week, we're talking about sundowning. You might have heard that term before. If the person you're taking care of has Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia, they may experience the symptoms of sundowning. And the trigger appears to be the fading light as the sun goes down. Sometimes Alzheimer's patients become more agitated and there are actually about uh, 15 symptoms that I wanna talk to you about today. Um, it can also happen not just with Alzheimer's, but other forms of dementia too. Doctors aren't really sure why this syndrome happens. The theory that they have is that if the part of the brain that houses the clock, it's an internal clock in the brain that tells us when to wake up and when to go to sleep, if that part of the brain is being affected, by the Alzheimer's or dementia, then the person may experience the symptoms that I'm going to talk about today. The most common symptom is distorted reality. One of the most common uh, symptoms of the disease is this distorted thinking. The person might think that they are a young mother or a young father just having a baby. That's why sometimes when you go into some Alzheimer's facilities, they will have a baby station and some of the women especially like to hold the baby dolls and they think that it's their child and that they are a young mother. They might think they're in college or in kindergarten, uh, going to the junior prom. They, it will be something long-term memory that they will envision themselves being in. <clears throat> and trying to bring the person back into your reality, refuting their um, claims of where they think they are, is just going to cause the person to become more agitated. One of the first things I learned when I uh, started into Alzheimer's care was you cannot bring a person with brain impairment into your world, you must go into their world. And you'll see that with some of these symptoms that I talk about today. Another symptom is restlessness. And as I said, the internal clock gets tweaked a little bit. And so when I worked at an Alzheimer's community, some of our residents would be up all night and sleep all day. So their clock was completely turned around. Some people get up and walk around at nighttime, which can be very dangerous if they live by themselves or if you're asleep during the night and your loved ones are wandering around the house <clears throat> or possibly even trying to go outside of the house. Um, that can be a fall risk. They can get lost. Uh, they can get into things that they're not supposed to. So that can be pretty dangerous. That um, usually happens later on in the disease process. Sometimes a person might start yelling and that this can happen late at night. And even though it seems like because they're yelling that they're angry with you, it might just be the way they're, they're talking because they're agitated. That they, It's really hard for family caregivers not to take things like that personally, but it's important for you to know that it's their way of communicating to you in their distorted uh, state that they're in at the time. Irritability is another common symptom. And so as the day progresses, late afternoon, early evening, the person becomes more irritable. So obviously we want to do things like doctor's appointments, bathing, and having discussions with that person earlier in the day when they're more clear-headed and not as irritable. Suspicion is a really common symptom also. The person may be suspicious of you and uh, some of the things that you're doing. Um, I can understand why a person might feel this way. You know, if your checkbook suddenly taken away, you're not even living in your own house possibly, they might think 
that something shady is going on or that you're an imposter or that you're lying to them or that you're hiding something or that you have a malicious agenda. And we know that's not the case, but this is how they see things. The important thing in this case is to comply with them and also to acknowledge their feel their fear or their emotion you know to say you seem really upset about this how can we make it better hallucinations is another thing that sometimes happens hallucinations can also be a side effect of some medications but with sundowning it it is a symptom sometimes the person might just see somebody that you don't see or they see a bright light and the best thing to do is to say that you see it too uh, I know a lot of people don't like to lie to their care recipient. However, the Alzheimer's Association calls it therapeutic fibbing because it's a lot easier to just go along with the person than to try to argue or convince them that it's not there because, again, this is their reality. Confusion, of course, is part of the whole disease process, but it is a common symptom of sundowning. Just imagine how confused you would be if you only had bits and pieces of your memory. So that person might forget who they are, they might forget who you are, and be fearful. So this might cause them to go into a state of panic and become violent even. So we want to try to catch this in the beginning and if they start becoming really anxious and confused mood swings it's very difficult to regulate your mood when you have no sense or logic or memory just think about it as being drunk and sedated and suffering from amnesia all at the same time that's what this person is dealing with fear of course is a pretty common symptom they, uh, as it starts getting darker, they may become more fearful. And so we just want to reassure the person and uh, let them know that they're in a safe place and that you're going to take care of them. Anxiety is also prevalent when dealing with uh, people who are affected by sundowning syndrome. And many uh, people confuse anxiety and stress. <clears throat> now, stress is something that's in, uh, affected by an outside environmental uh, force. For instance, if your boss puts a deadline on you to get something, a big project done, you feel stress. Sometimes the stress can be good because that stress motivates us to get it done. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody who's anxious all the time. And so again, we wanna reassure the person uh, re that they're safe and that you're there for them. Depression. Sometimes depression can coexist with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and many times the depression is not diagnosed. And if the depression is diagnosed, if medication is prescribed, a lot of times it looks like the dementia is getting better, but it's actually the depression symptoms that are being treated because depression and early stages of Alzheimer's and dementia look very similar. The person becomes withdrawn, they're not as spontaneous and things like that. So about uh, 3 million Americans in general have depression. So it's not an uncommon diagnosis. That's about 1.5% of the whole population. And it really does affect people mostly in the early stages of the disease process because think about it, they realize that they're starting to forget and make mistakes and they can't quite understand what's going on and so that's usually when they have depression so we want to again uh, reassure the person that they're okay pacing and wandering not everyone with alzheimer's disease uh, has this happen, but some people do, and it usually lasts for about six to nine months of the disease process. And it can be a safety hazard, it can be a fall hazard, a dehydration, and malnutrition factor. Because sometimes when they get into this phase of walking, walking, walking all the time, they don't want to sit down to eat, they don't want to sit down to drink or do anything. So, the best thing we can do is 
Make sure that where they're walking is safe so that it's not a fall hazard. Um, make sure they're not going to go out of the house without someone with them and uh, offer them water so that they don't become dehydrated. And of course, try to redirect the person. Hey, mom, look, I made your favorite dessert. Come on over here. Or guess what? Your favorite Tease It Fee show's on. Let's watch it. Just try to distract the person and get them to rest at least for a few minutes. Fatigue is another uh, sundowning syndrome. And especially if the person's really active during the day, if they're going through that wandering stage or they're just busy, busy, busy all day long, they might become very fatigued in the late afternoon and early evening. This exasperates any symptoms that they might have. So they might become more ir irritable easily um, and frustrated and confused and be fearful and be anxious. So we want to make sure that they rest and that uh, they're not too fatigued at the end of the day. Let it play out. Patients with dementia and sundowning syndrome require managed care to ensure their safety. And unfortunately, many caregivers, especially family members, may try to alter the behavior of the affected uh, person. And again, like I said, we must go into their world. The caregiver may try to make them complete a task um, to make them feel better. Sometimes we can't really force the person to do something that we want them to do. This is a really good way to approach someone with memory loss, and that's validate, reassure, and distract. So by validating, we might say something like, I notice you look like you're feeling afraid or anxious right now. It's okay to feel that way. Let them know this is part of the disease process and it's, it's not abnormal that they're feeling this way. And, you know, acknowledge their feeling is the, is the main thing. And then right after acknowledging it, um, it reassuring the person even though you're fearful or anxious i want you to know that i'm right here with you and you are safe so and then distract is what i talked about earlier after you validate reassure then say hey guess what let's go over here and play cards or let's play bingo or a game or something and try to distract the person and redirect them into something else so that they change their thought pattern Many times, if you just walk outside with the person or into another room, it can shift their thinking pattern. And so let's take, a, let's take a little walk in the sunshine, go outside, and then they start talking about the things they see outside, and that can shift their thinking right away. Although we can't stop the sundowning uh, completely, we can take steps to manage this challenging time of the day. So both of you, the caregiver and the care receiver, get to sleep better and less tired during the day. And you might wanna let your loved one's doctor know that they're going through this because sometimes there are medications that can help too. Look for patterns, note the thing that seems to trigger it. So right before the behavior starts, whatever that behavior is, note what happens right before that so that you can avoid or limit those triggers. Keep a daily routine, set regular times for waking up, meals and going to sleep. Try to schedule appointments and outings and visits and bath time in the early part of the day when they're likely to feel better and they're not, it's not the later part of the day. Limit or avoid things that affect uh, sleep like caffeine, alcohol, and things like that. You might even want to um, serve a larger lunch and then a lighter dinner uh, so that they sleep better. So those are some of the tips I wanted to share with you on sundown and I hope they were helpful for you. And I will be back next Tuesday with Facebook Live and some new topics to discuss next week. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Bye.